Good afternoon. Uh, welcome. I'm very glad to see you here today. Um, today's lecture is uh, sponsored by the Center for African Studies and the Center for European Studies. Um, my name is Joshua Cole, and I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our speaker, Professor Michelle Moyd of Indiana University. Professor Moyd received her PhD in 2008 from Cornell, where she worked closely with both Africanists and Europeanists in the history department. She has been the recipient of numerous awards and fellowship. I'll just name a couple. Uh, she has been a resident fellow at the International Research Center on Work and Human Life Cycle in, in, world, in Global History at the Humboldt University in Berlin. She's also been a resident fellow at the Institute for Historical Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. She has a book in progress, in fact, it's coming out in July, is that right? Um, entitled, Violent Intermediaries, African Soldiers, Conquest, and Everyday Colonialism in German East Africa. This is gonna be published by Ohio State University Press. She's already published uh, five articles and book chapters on related subjects, and this work has already and very quickly established her reputation as an important member of an extremely dynamic cohort of younger scholars whose work is reshaping our understanding of World War I. As I'm sure you all know, there's no shortage of work on the Great War, but much of this literature has focused on the European theater of conflict, events on the Western Front in particular. Now, the cutting edge of World War I research in recent years has aimed at expanding this focus. Um, I was recently at the American Historical Association in Washington, D.C. in January, and there was not one but two panels on thinking about World War I in a, in a global context. And there were some amazing historians there, Professor Moyd, Mustafa Aksakal, who was here at Michigan earlier in the semester talking about the Ottoman Empire and their relationship to Germany. Beyond that, there was scholars such as Christopher Capazola, Santan Udas, Richard Fogarty, Jennifer Keene, Erez Manella. This is a group of very interesting scholars who are now insisting that we think of World War I in its broadest global context as a war of empires. It's, it's uh, something that I very much wanted to showcase in the series of lectures that the Center for European Studies is sponsoring this year um, to commemorate the beginnings of World War I. And I was very delighted that Michelle Moyd has accepted our invitation to visit us here today. The title of her talk is Centering a Sideshow, World War I in German East Africa as Local Experience. Please join me in welcoming Professor Moyd. Oh, um, well, thank you all for being here today. Uh, special thanks to Professor Cole for the invitation and to Zana Kweiser for all the um, administrative support in getting me here. Everything's gone really perfectly. So, um, and this is my first visit to uh, Ann Arbor and to University of Michigan. So, um, uh, I'm delighted that I had the chance to come and share uh, some of my work uh, as it's in progress, actually. Um, I'm wrapping up my, as you heard, uh, my first project, which was my dissertation, now my first book, um, and I'm kind of uh, in the middle of some things. This is one of them, because the, uh, the centenary of the war, of course, is this year, and uh, it gives me a good chance to think about my project, uh, on, which is on African colonial soldiers, um, partly in World War I, but uh, partly in a much longer uh, historical trajectory um, to expand out of that and to, to kind of think in more global terms about um, about my own work. So I wanted to just underline the point that this is a work in progress. Um, I presented a previous version of this talk at the American Historical Association, as Professor Cole mentioned, um, and I've also been working on this piece for a special is issue of a French journal, which will be coming out later this year. Um, and I'm also going to be undertaking uh, the, the writing of a small kind of textbook volume on World War I in Africa. So um, all of your comments and questions are very welcome uh, in, in helping me, hopefully helping me um, think about my blind spots and what sorts of uh, problems I might need to investigate further. Um, so let me just start, I'll plan to speak for maybe 45 minutes or so. Um, and then 
hope for your questions and suggestions at the end. Um, as historians and others reassess the legacies of World War I 100 years on, we should keep in mind a very simple point, and that is that the war mattered to those who lived through it. This simple truth holds regardless of where various war experiences occurred, on Europe's western or eastern fronts, uh, Mesopotamia, China, Africa, Turkey, uh, and everywhere else the war touched between 1914 and 1918 and beyond. It mattered in very predictable ways. Loved ones died in combat, as well as from diseases and malnourishment. Veterans returned home with wounded bodies and minds, as well as expectations of heightened status and socioeconomic privilege, or at the very least, respectable employment. These veterans, whose experiences had changed them irrevocably, often found it difficult to rejoin their home communities after the war. Armies uh, seized resources and often destroyed the livelihoods of those unfortunate enough to reside in campaign geographies. New political arrangements during and after the war meant change in the everyday lives of vast numbers of people who had little or no input into the shaping of these new arrangements. So in these broad ways, experiences in, dif in different theaters of the war had much in common. To make this point is not at all to dispute the importance of the war in Europe. Um, I don't think I need to go on about this, but uh, of course um, there are good reasons for um, the, the, central, um, uh, the central thrust of understanding World War I to be located in Europe. Um, but historians' tendencies to sideline or ignore other theaters of war in favor of an exclusive focus on the war in Europe or on European perspectives undermines our ability to understand its effects on local populations around the world, including Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, as well as in transnational, imperial, and global terms. Even worse, it renders other experiences and perspectives less, less historically valuable than those of the ostensible center of the war in Europe. Um, Africa mattered to the European powers at the beginning of the 20th century, asserts Edward Pace uh, in the opening line of his impressive and sophisticated history of the war in Africa. This is undoubtedly a vital point, for it foregrounds the imperial character of the Great War. At the same time, however, and despite Pace's commendable treatment of the war's tragic consequences for Africans, this opening formulation, uh, the opening to his book, um, centers European desires for mastery over Africa in the narrative. So Africa mattered to Europe because of its place in imperial economies, politics, and imaginaries. World War I in Africa certainly represented, quote, the climax of Africa's exploitation, its use as a mere battlefield, unquote. Uh, that's a, uh, a nice quote that comes from John Eilis, uh, old, old, <laughs> came out in 1979, history of uh, Tanganyika. But stopping with this observation leads to a flattening of the comp complexities and variety of African wartime experiences and the ramifications these had in the post-war period. Generalizations about how the war affected Africa necessarily obscure the diversity of experiences that shaped local politics, economies, social structures, and cultural expression during and after the war. To those who lived through the war in different African settings and contexts, what did it mean? What costs and opportunities emerged? What strategies did people employ to survive, evade, or benefit from wartime circumstances? How did African experiences in the war sometimes resemble, sometimes differ from those in Europe and elsewhere? On one, on one level, uh, what I want to talk to you about today in, with this paper uh, marks a start in my, my own effort to move the African campaign of World War I to the center of analysis in order to see what emerges. Historians have described the African campaigns and other campaigns outside of Europe as sideshows, hence the, uh, centering a sideshow in my title today. Uh, in general histories of the war, the African campaigns feature fleetingly, if at all, and local histories receive very little attention. We could perhaps excuse this state of affairs if no scholarship on the war in Africa existed upon which to construct bigger narratives, but this is not the case. A respectable body of scholarship on the Great War in Africa exists, 
Yet most general histories of the First World War devote scant attention to the African context. Those that do tend to focus on military operations and less so on how Africans experienced the war and its various political, social, cultural, and economic outcomes. <clears throat> Studying the Great War from African perspectives provides a basis for reflection on what the world in World War I means. Uh, the historian Hugh Strawn, who is, uh, is one of the preeminent scholars of World War I, um, has argued, quote, the title, The World War, was a statement about its importance, not a statement about its geographical scale, unquote. This may be true of, and he's, so he's describing uh, the contemporary, um, i.e. 1914 to 1918, understanding of it. So this may be true of those contemporary discussions, but 100 years later, we need not be limited by this meaning. On one level, then, I argue that we can and should do more to bring work on the Great War into sustained conversation with other historiographies in order to highlight the ways that different histor histories of the war are entangled with each other, making it a global human experience. Such work might open up new lines of inquiry leading to multifaceted understandings of large-scale historical developments, such as population movements and demographic shifts, political and economic developments, and the nature of warfare in this period. Research in this vein could help soften the lines between the so-called center and periphery, or sideshow, as analyti analytical categories. In addition, asking new questions about how different kinds of imperial actors, so uh, subjects, colonizers, intermediaries, government officials, diplomats, soldiers, etc., experienced the war, how these different actors experienced the war, brings local perspectives into focus, yielding new narratives that allow us to see the Great War in its global proportions. So uh, what I'm focusing on today is the East African campaign of World War I for several reasons, and the most obvious and mundane of those is that it's my area of expertise. Um, but also, the volume of historiography on that campaign, uh, and there were four in, uh, in Africa, four uh, campaigns of World War I in Africa, but um, the historiography on the East Africa came, campaign far outstrips any of the others. Um, Second, perhaps more than any other campaign in Africa, the war in East Africa reflected the priorities or lack thereof of the European empires that fought there. Um, and this, had, this has to do with um, the ways that resources were deployed um, or not deployed um, and the kinds of uh, attention that, that was paid to um, political decisions that were made there and so on. Third, the East Africa campaign's duration, slightly longer than the war on Europe's Western Front, undermines any notion that the war in Africa was inconsequential for any of the numerous parties involved. Um, it, you know, in East Africa, the war lasted for over four years. Um, so there's no disputing that it mattered um, to somebody. It mattered to the people who were fighting there, and it mattered to the European powers that were willing to keep sending troops and resources there. Um, so during these years of sustained violence, Africa mattered to Europe and Europe mattered to Africa in ways that re revealed continuities in imperial encounters, but also in ways that signaled new arrangements and possibilities for all concerned. Um, the next section of this paper, I, I have some remarks on the methodological and historiographical challenges of doing this kind of work. Um, I won't say much about this section here in the interest of time, but I wanted to just um, make one major point, which is that one of the reasons people have uh, perhaps neglected uh, the inclusion of uh, theaters like the one that I study is that it's very difficult to bring together all of the, it's very difficult for one historian to um, master or even to uh, have, uh, have access to all the kinds of different archives and literatures that you need to, to really be able to put together um, comprehensive histories. So in my case, for example, you'd have, to, um, you'd have to be looking at German archives, Tanzanian archives, uh, and, and British archives at a minimum. And then it would also be helpful if you looked at Belgian ones and, uh, uh, and probably 
some other ones, Portuguese ones. Um, I was talking to a graduate student earlier today who reminded me of this point. Um, so it's, it's tough. It's, it requires stamina, it requires resources, it requires mastering historiographies that uh, one may, may not be familiar with. So it's challenging, and uh, I don't want to, to make light of that point. Um, so uh, with that, I'll press on to the main section of, of, of my paper. Uh, what, I, what I want to do is to kind of point up uh, what I've identified as maybe four levels of analysis that would yield that could yield fruitful results in writing about the Great War from an African perspective, and uh, so I'm sort of thinking of these as different vantage points from which one might be able to reveal certain kinds of insights that would push research on World War One forward. forward. First, um, and I'll just briefly go through them and then. Um, revisit them in the rest of my remarks. Um, first, I will focus on the ways of, the various ways of war that, um, that were used in the East Africa campaign. And what I mean by that is war fighting, but also um, the kind of culturally and socially embedded understandings of what it meant to be at war in East Africa from an African perspective. So trying to move away from a, a, a top-down operational history of what happened in the campaign to a, more of a localized understanding of, um, of what the war meant. Second, I look at what motivated or dissuaded African colonial soldiers and porters. This is very important, porters being uh, people who were hired or pressed into service to carry all of the military's equipment um, during these campaigns. I'll explain this more later. But so looking at what motivated or dissuaded uh, these soldiers and porters and other laborers to remain in service during the East African campaign. I mean, what was in it for them? Why would these people uh, be invested in fighting for what was a war that was essentially driven by European interests? Third, I examine how East African communities experienced the war. Um, so how they uh, interpreted and responded to their changing circumstances by drawing on uh, their own memory and expressive cultures, um, and how and what I'm trying to do here is to think about um, what might have been different about East African experiences of the war, um, again, in their local context, uh, what those might have had in common with people in other parts of the world, and how they might have differed. Um, and then the fourth area that I'll uh, end with, and which is also the briefest uh, section of my paper, because it's the one that I know the least about, um, is that I call attention to the need for new research on the transition from German rule in East Africa to mandate rule, and, uh, British mandate rule, as a way of tying local historical developments in East Africa to international currents and phenomena. And um, of course, for West Africa, we would be looking at, at French control, and for Southwest Africa, we would be looking at South African control. So um, those are the four uh, theaters that, um, that uh, we would be looking at in order to understand how uh, different peoples of East Africa experienced the transition from World War I to the post-war period. All right, so let me start with um, the section on the way of war, ways of war. Um, and here uh, I, I wanted to, I'm starting with this campaign map, just in case people aren't familiar with, um, there it is. Um, in case people aren't familiar with the geography of East Africa and uh, what happened in this campaign, which um, if, you're a, if you're a World War I person, you may have read things about this campaign because it sort of has all the markers of an adventure story and um, involves this general, Paul von Leto Forbeck, who um, is generally described as a, as a great leader of men, somebody who is able to mobilize his troops, his, his vastly outnumbered and under-equipped troops to outlast uh, and escape from the, uh, the allied forces which were encroaching from all sides. So, um, so this is uh, present 
right here is present day Tanzania, um, German East Africa from 1890 to 1918. And um, what you're seeing represented on this map is uh, this dotted line is the, uh, are the routes that uh, General Leto Forbeck led his troops on as they tried to evade the uh, Allied forces which were encroaching from all sides. So the British uh, Navy attacking from the coast, um, uh, South Africans coming up through what is today Zambia, um, and then uh, Belgian troops or uh, Belgian colonial troops coming from what is today Belgian Congo. Um, and then, of course, the British coming in from the north as well, from British East Africa, today's Kenya. So um, what you see here is obviously that Germany, the, the German colonial forces are very much hemmed in. And Leto Vorbeck decided to, uh, instead of trying to confront them uh, in set piece battles in all of these places, he decided to, uh, to wage war, wage a war of maneuver, sorry. Um, which then led him to, to um, direct his troops, I keep losing the cursor, um, direct his troops to assemble here in the southern parts of uh, what is today Tanzania um, and ultimately to cross into what is today Mozambique, Portuguese East Africa, which um, was also on the side of the Allies, um, and to kind of drag the Allies in this mobile war um, all the way through November 1918 until he surrendered his forces in, um, actually it's here where he surrendered at Abercorn in uh, what is today Zambia. So, um, so that tells you something right there just in this representation of what was going on in the war in, in East Africa. This is not the Western Front by any stretch. This is a highly mobile, hit-and-run style of warfare that Leto Vorbeck waged against the Allies. Um, it was there's a there's a novel that came out, I believe, in the 70s called *An Ice Cream War* by William Boyd, um, and the ice cream war he's referring to is the is um, is the idea that these German soldiers, African uh, colonial soldiers, uh, were able to just kind of melt away into the into the bush after having launched these hit and run attacks against the Allies, making it very difficult for the Allies to, um, to, to defeat them. Um, and so it has all the markers of a guerrilla style warfare and it's led to a kind of mythology about Leto Forbeck and his so-called loyal Askari, Askari being the um, Swahili and Arabic word for um, these colonial soldiers that were employed in uh, in East Africa, and um, and has really kind of made this campaign stand out in the history of World War One in Africa, more so than the than campaigns elsewhere in Africa. Um, so that's uh, one part of the way of war kind of um, interest area that I have is uh, you know what can be drawn from contrasting this with other theaters. Uh, besides the Western Front, we could also look at what happened in the Middle East, um, Gallipoli, um, et cetera. Um, and then this, uh, this photograph also gives you, should give you a strong idea of uh, another contrast that, um, that really marks this campaign as different from the Western Front and, and many campaigns of World War I. Uh, this is a very famous photograph. If, you, if you've ever seen photography from World War I in East Africa, you've probably seen this picture. Um, it, is the, it is a column of soldiers, whoops, a column of soldiers, um, and probably back here there are porters who are carrying all of the equipment for these troops. And these columns were reported to be sometimes um, a couple of miles long, you know, just, uh, and of course it's, the effect is heightened by the fact they're marching through this uh, very open savanna um, kind of terrain. But um, this is how they maneuvered. This is how soldiers maneuvered during the war in East Africa. And um, 
the fact that they had to have all of their equipment transported with them during this, during these operations, uh, also kind of um, makes this campaign uh, unique in as much as we're talking about very little mechanization, um, very little use of pack animals because of the tsetse fly and um, transmission of sleeping sickness, which made it very difficult to use uh, animals for transport. Um, so human laborers did most of the work of carrying uh, food, water, military equipment, um, including artillery pieces and machine guns and, and things like that that were extremely heavy and unwieldy. Um, and so these are the, this is the kind of warfare that we're talking about in East Africa that uh, is quite a contrast from, from what you would see elsewhere. Um, make sure that I. There's, a, you know, another of the um, another of the interesting things about the way this campaign is represented, um, it has been represented in the historiography, is that it uh, is often depicted as kind of a cat and mouse game between Leto Forbeck and other commanders who were operating in the area, um, and that nature itself played a role in how the war was fought. So. Um, you know, the, there, the fact that there were lion attacks um, against columns like these, uh, the fact that there were horrible insects that um, attacked, uh, you know, attacked people. Um, in fact, uh, at one of the battles, one of the very early battles in the war at, at Tanga, which is on the northeastern coast of Tanzania, it was uh, part of the lore of the battle is that um, uh, the Germans were actually able to unleash a hive of bees onto the attacking British, um, which uh, clearly was not the case, but it just so happened that uh, bees did attack troops who were invading from the coast during the battle, um, and it was a factor in how the battle um, ended up unfolding, and the Germans won um, in part because the British forces that were invading from the coast were um, debilitated by this horrible, you know, swarm of bees. But um, this campaign has lent itself to a kind of adventure story genre that um, you don't see elsewhere, or I haven't seen elsewhere in um, discussions of the war. Okay. So um, this sort of gives you an overview of my, my thinking on a set of ideas of how to um, perhaps bring uh, the East Africa campaign into into conversation with other uh, campaigns of the war. Um, and let me move on then to the next section, which I uh, which has to do with whether or not um, soldiers, porters, and other laborers decided to stay with the Germans. So as I showed you in this map, um, the German forces were kind of encircled on all sides, and it led to this highly mobile kind of style of, of warfare, and also some very hard times for those who were involved in the column, who were part of the columns, because they couldn't be resupplied. They had no access from the coast. Uh, there were some, some uh, kind of adventurous efforts to resupply them, uh, for example, by um, airship. Um, so there are these really strange elements of this campaign. Um, but it all in all, it was, it was difficult for these, for the Schutztruppe of the German forces to, to receive new supplies. Uh, they obviously were low on manpower, and um, things looked pretty grim for them. So what is it about, uh, what was it about the, um, the operation or the, the organization, I suppose, that made them willing to stay or not. Um, so uh, one way to go about accessing African perspectives on the war is to is to pose a set of interrelated questions about how soldiers ended up in the Schutztruppe in the first place. So here we would need to know something about uh, how recruitment took place, um, under, the, under what circumstances they made themselves available for recruitment, or um, if they avoided it, how they did that. Um, 
how new recruits might differ from long-term veterans. Um, you know, there's a difference between somebody who's been in the Army for 20 years and somebody who's being forced to join against their will. Uh, what, what ultimately were they willing to fight for? These are the kinds of questions that I'm interested in here. Uh, so the soldiers and porters who went to war in German East Africa between 1914 and 1918 came from all over Eastern and Southeastern Africa. Um, and their experiences of recruitment or conscription varied quite widely. They, uh, all of the colonial powers in East Africa had small standing armies and uh, contingents of porters that provided the foundation for the armies that fought the Great War. Uh, so during the war, there was a dramatic increase in recruitment and conscription of both soldiers and porters. Um, the numbers uh, kind of went up from approximately 2,500 men at the Schutztruppe's disposal in 1914 up to about 11,000 troops in 1916. And uh, I'll just scroll to the end here. This is uh, just to give you a sense of the difference in manpower resources. Uh, these are some numbers, recruitment numbers for the, the King's African Rifles in, uh, uh, so the King's African Rifles being the uh, British East African Colonial Force, which did much of the fighting against the German force in East Africa. Um, you can see that between 1914 and 1918, uh, there's a huge expansion in the numbers of soldiers that are available which is not surprising, but um, just kind of gives you a sense of the uh, progression of recruitment there. Um, so um, just to kind of give you a sense of the demographics uh, here, rank and file Ascari before the war tended to be so-called volunteers who received wages, status, and benefits from the German colonial government. And this image that I have here is um, a photograph very likely staged. Um, in fact, I'm sure it was staged because nobody would pose like this uh, normally. But um, this is an Ascari who is uh, being uh, represented as if he's going off to war. Um, and we are to understand that this is his family, his, uh, a wife and some children um, who are bidding him farewell as he goes off to war. Um, and what I've argued in my previous work is that we should understand these soldiers' motivations for staying with the Schutztruppe as having very little to do with Germany's goals for the war um, or uh, German goals in the colonies at all. Uh, what these men were in it for was the ability to achieve respectability, the ability to, over time, uh, gain enough stature through the wages that were paid to them by the Schutztruppe to um, to be able to uh, to build a large household, um, to have a number of dependents who uh, viewed them as the head of household, and to be able to then uh, wield that status uh, as uh, and to kind of perform the role of big man in local African context. So. These men were, you know, to be blunt, in it for themselves. They were in it as a, uh, as a way to achieve respectability. Um, they were not in it to, for the king and Kaiser and, and, and Germany. That's what I would argue. Um, now, so that's in the early stages of the war. In the latter half of the war, the tide turned against the Schutztruppe. So we're talking about after 1916, when this, that encroachment that I showed you really began to take a toll on the Schutztruppe's ability to, um, to reconstitute itself. And its recruitment tactics changed in response to that. Uh, the Ascari began rounding up young men, pressing them into service as soldiers, porters, and servants. And um, understandably, these men who were facing a new kind of recruitment environment had very little investment in the Schutztruppe organization. Um, the, uh, the hardships of combat in the last two years of the war made it impossible for the Schutztruppe to guarantee them anything that might encourage commitment to the organization. So whereas before, the Germans had been able to offer uh, steady wages, um, 
land grants in retirement, uh, protection and a kind of um, domestic upkeep for their families, that sort of thing. All of that fell by the wayside in the wartime context because uh, there was no central government anymore to guarantee the payment of wages. Uh, there was no, um, there was the, the, the relationship that had existed between officers and soldiers uh, as a sort of patron-client relationship had broken down in the, uh, under the stresses of this wartime situation. So from their perspectives, from the perspectives of these new recruits, um, fighting in the Schutztruppe offered very little material, social, or political incentive to encourage them to stay in the ranks. And desertions became a severe problem for the Schutztruppe in the last half of the war. Um, and this is an important point because uh, one of the parts of this mythology that I talked about before with Leto Forbeck and the loyal Ascari um, has, has kind of been, it was picked up in the historiography after the war and really kind of um, pursued relentlessly and, and historians didn't question it all that much until fairly recently. But the fact is that um, there were <laughs> there were only about, there were less than 2,000 Ascari left at the end of the war uh, when Leto Forbeck surrendered in northern uh, Zambia, or northern Rhodesia um, in 1918. There were less than 2,000 soldiers left, which means that, you know, uh, some 9,000, 8 to 9,000 troops were not there anymore through a combination of being killed, uh, having died of disease, or having deserted. And um, so this is, uh, you know, it, it seems like it should be an obvious flag for uh, kind of undermining the loyal Ascari myth, but it's interesting that it lasted, that that myth lasted in historiography for the length of time that it did. Um, okay. Uh, this is a picture of some British porters, um, or excuse me, British East African porters who were um, uh, transporting probably King's African rifles supplies just to give you a sense of this human labor contingent that was so important in uh, the conduct of the war. Um, and again, you, if you recall that picture of the long column of soldiers, the porters would have been towards the rear of that column and they would have been under the soldiers protection and and uh, in many cases uh, the porters would have been watched like hawks um, so that they so that um, they wouldn't be able to abscond with any goods that um, might be useful to them uh, so but the important point here is just to um, demonstrate the importance of this, uh, this kind of logistical structure, which was not, uh, not the case in Europe, as far as I know, um, and uh, is, a, is a very different kind of uh, way of managing logistical, uh, a logistical challenge than, um, than what we're perhaps familiar with on the Western Front. Um, and just briefly to, uh, to make the point about why porters stayed or left, uh, their circumstances were even harsher than what soldiers uh, in the Schutztruppe or the, the King's African Rifles would have experienced. Porters received far less rations than soldiers did. Uh, they were subject to a lot of the same kind of dangers that soldiers were, but without the ability to protect themselves. Uh, they didn't have firearms, for example. Um, but you know, they, because of the style of warfare that was being used, they were as close to enemy fire as were the soldiers. So, um, so they suffered greatly, and uh, their death rates are quite notorious in um, that on all sides, uh, so the Belgians, the Germans, the British, all lost thousands and thousands of porters to, um, to poor conditions uh, and desertion. Um, so just uh, briefly to make that point about why they stayed or left. In the porter's case, they, they tended not to stay if they could <coughs> avoid staying. Um, and uh, some porters were paid wages, uh, but many of them were pressed into service against their will. So. Um, here again, we would need to look closely at the uh, 
the, the kinds of, uh, the styles of recruitment and at what point in the war those styles uh, came to the fore. Uh, in British East Africa, there was a much stronger drive to, um, to recruit porters, uh, to, to hire a professional porter corps. Um, but of course, as the war went on and on and they needed more and more manpower, uh, those kinds of um, um, goals probably fell by the wayside in favor of pressing people into service. Okay, um, just briefly here, I'd like to also point out that uh, the porters kind of, um, so there's, there, are, there were people who were, rec who were recruited specifically to work as porters. There were also the dependents of the Ascari who, uh, and this is another part of the way of war, way of war um, section that I should have mentioned. Um, so in these long columns, you would see not just soldiers, porters, um, and up here, these are the um, these are the European officers, by the way. Um, you would also find somewhere in this column a contingent of women and children who are the dependents of either soldiers or porters. Um, and uh, the reason I bring this up is because they too had, uh, they were expected to contribute to the effort, the war effort, um, in part as porters. They, they carried goods for, um, for their Ascari. Um, they also took care of cooking, cleaning, uh, nursing sick soldiers, uh, gathering food, water, firewood, and all of, uh, all of the things that it takes to manage uh, domestic life when you're on the move. Um, a way to describe this, this whole kind of complex would be campaign communities. This is a term that John Lynn uh, has, has used in his work. He's a historian of um, early modern Europe and has done um, quite a bit of work on uh, trying to understand um, trying to understand these uh, campaign communities as mobile as communities at war, I guess. And um, so I just wanted to point up that there, is, there are significant gendered elements here too um, in understanding why, why or why not soldiers would stay with the column. If your family is integrated into this column, it makes it very difficult for you as a respectable man to, um, to break away from the column uh, to desert, for example, or um, or to abandon the column for um, for safety. Um, there are emotional ties here that we have to, emotional and practical ties that we have to keep in mind here. Okay. Um, in terms of the kind of wider impact of understanding the war in East Africa, um, there are a number of directions I could go with this, but I, what I want to do today is just talk a little bit about the collective memories of um, some of the communities that were hit hardest by uh, this, this style of warfare, this kind of, um, these columns. And so this is just the Schutz, this is just a Schutztruppe column. You have to imagine too that there are King's African Rifles columns that are marching behind these, chasing them through. Uh, the southern reaches of Tanzania into Portuguese East Africa. So there's this um, kind of constant um, barrage of columns of men and their families and, uh, and dependents um, marching through lands that uh, were then kind of denuded of their, uh, their own food supplies, their livestock, uh, as these armies took whatever they could find along the way. Um, it's, a, it's an extreme case of living off the land um, because, as I've mentioned, uh, they weren't being resupplied from outside, so they have to find food somewhere. And in general, the people who suffered the most were people who lived, let me get here, lived in this area, uh, the southern highlands of Tanzania, which um, is, as I mentioned earlier, the, the area that Leto Forbeck kind of staged all of his troops before uh, moving into Portuguese East Africa in late 1916. Um, 
And what's important to understand about this area historically is that this is also a region that was um, heavily affected by colonial warfare. It was an area where a massive rebellion um, known as Maji Maji, which was an anti-colonial rebellion. I, I can't explain all of the details of it here, but um, it was a war that was fought between 1905-1907 and um, engaged the Schutztruppe uh, in a kind of warfare that ultimately led them to resort to a, um, uh, what's the word, um, where they, uh, gosh, uh, scorched earth scorched earth style of warfare in which they uh, um, they seized every kind of resource that they could and anything that they couldn't take along with them they burnt to the ground and what that meant for the people who lived in these areas was that n not only did they lose what they had but they lost any ability to regenerate for the next few seasons so in agricultural societies of course the the inability to harvest is uh, devastating. It's devastating not just in the fact that they can't um, they can't feed themselves, but uh, it also has implications for the ability to reproduce, right? So, in an area like this that had experienced intensive uh, and sequential uh, colonial uh, warfare, um, the the arrival of World War One, as it were. Uh, was not it was not a new thing. It was something that added to a longer history of colonial warfare. It was um, another in a long sequence of having been abused by the colonizers. Um, and so the people who lived in these regions had uh, perhaps a differential understanding of uh, the temporal framework that we think of uh, when we think about World War I we think of 1914 to 1918 people who live in the southern lived in the southern highlands um, perhaps would think in a longer trajectory of say uh, 1895 to 1918 or something like that because the number of times that the Schutztruppe had run over that area militarily um, perhaps would collapse some of the um, differentiation between wars that we would tend to think of reading a hundred years, over a hundred years later. Um, there are also profound implications for the gender and inter intergenerational relationships that um, that kind of shaped the way that societies worked. Uh, here, very quickly, um, one of the ways that relationships were sealed in many East African communities um, was through marriage, of course, and uh, one of the ways that marriage could be, um, the one, one of the ways that people could make marriage appealing uh, was for young men to have enough livestock to, um, enough livestock to present uh, bride wealth. And um, in a case where uh, the livestock have been seized and there are no more livestock to be traded or exchanged in a marriage ceremony, that means that the whole institution essentially breaks down or, or is transformed in such a dramatic way that it no longer resembles what existed before. So um, it's not just that, a, that marriages couldn't take place, it was also that um, a whole kind of um, social mechanism uh, was brought into, was thrown into question and and um, and disarray, and uh, so and there are of course gendered implications here. If uh, if men uh, can't secure marriages through livestock, then perhaps they will be more enticed to go work for the colonizers as wage laborers um, in order to earn cash, so that they can buy livestock themselves. And so there are all of these much deeper implications to uh, just uh, than just having livestock seized uh, um, from peoples who depended on them. Okay, let me just conclude very quickly on um, the subject of the transition from uh, the German to British rule um, 
So German colonialism transitioning into British mandate rule, which uh, I think everyone would agree here was just another form of colonialism. Um, this is a really interesting area of research, and I, my, it's my hope that this uh, reflection period of reflection on World War I will uh, help us to have a better sense of what actually happened between, say, 1918 and 1925, when a number of uh, African um, societies went through a change in the colonial um, overlord and colonial structure. And it's really interesting that there hasn't been more focus on that really important, to me, important period of transition. Um, and here I would, you know, I would want to know more about what happened to African veterans, for example. Um, especially in the German case, it's very difficult to trace what happened to the Schutztruppe veterans because they just kind of get lost in the shuffle between uh, the Germans being hounded and chased around East Africa um, to the British who are trying to uh, set up a new kind of governmental structure in, um, in East Africa under conditions of warfare. So there's the archival material is missing and are uh, oftentimes uh, very difficult to recover. Um, and then there's also the problem of uh, people of historians having made this very clear break between the period of German rule ending in 1918 and the British becoming the mandate power in, well, I mean, effectively uh, 1918, but officially, I guess, 1922. Um, so uh, there's a lot, I think, that could be teased out of materials that exist but haven't really been mined yet for to understand that transition period better. Um, and so let me just read my concluding paragraph and then open it up to questions. Uh, there are a number of other possibilities for thinking about the Great War in East Africa as local context tied to global conflict. And we might just as easily use environmental, religious, or technological historical perspectives as starting points for revisiting this history. We might look more closely, for example, at episodes of anti-colonial resistance that occurred during the war to see what was really at stake for those involved. So, um, you know, there are there are examples of anti-colonial rebellion happening during the war, um, but they somehow get subsumed into uh, a bigger history about the war and and often don't get treated on their own terms. So I think there's, there's more to be done there. On the whole, there's more work to be done in accessing local perspectives on the war, comprehending how these perspectives affected political, social, and economic trajectories, and synthesizing these into a narrative that helps bring the African experience of the war into the wider historiography. The intellectual project of including African and other non-European experiences of the war will help tie the global to the local in meaningful ways as we reflect on the war's centenary and as we continue writing new, more inclusive histories of the war. Thank you. We have plenty of time for questions. Um, and I think I'll just let Michelle do okay. the questions if they come. Uh, I'm sorry I missed a part of your talk, so maybe you just cover it. Uh, my maternal grandfather was actually moved from India in 1905 to Tanzania. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, interestingly, uh, the business was set up, and then right at the start of the war, war, uh, World War I, uh, all these so-called assistants in the shop and stuff kind of had to go away. I think the Africans got captured. And this, this is what I hear from third parties, mm -hmm. and so each other. Mm -hmm. and, and so he went to go back to India to bring more help from there mm -hmm. uh, to work in the store, and he brought some orphans, and he, you know, they didn't have the quality of life, etc. Right. I'm just wondering, is there anything in your research that kind of addresses the role or the impact of the war on these kinds of diasporic uh, Um No, I, I haven't done anything like that. I think it's it would be an important another important area, and I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, I'm trying to think. There have been people who've done dias research on the diasporic um, communities. South Asian communities, especially for South Africa, um, and uh, some some in Tanzania, but for the later colonial period. Yeah. 
yeah, but not so much for the german period. so it's it's valid. i think there probably is a lot there, but i don't have the expertise. yes? um we talked a lot about um like the positions of mm -hmm. the soldiers and the borders. Mm -hmm. and i was wondering were there any like direct consequences that they faced besides like we talked or you talked about um how they were in it for the respectability besides mm -hmm. losing that or their like, direct consequences from the officers that they could fight against? yeah um there were threats uh from the from general leto forbeck himself said that if he caught if he was made aware of anybody who had deserted his columns he would have them hanged as an example so yes um and certainly the german military uh the the traject the the history of german military um operations in east africa would suggest that um soldiers would have believed that kind of a threat so so there was that um but uh, another factor that's interesting about this war and maybe others who have um expertise in other um theaters could let me know if this happened elsewhere but uh one of the one of the kind of side effects of soldiers being um motivated by what i've described as respectability desire to achieve respectability is that they didn't necessarily um see a problem with switching sides in the middle of the war if they felt that the that a different patron could secure their interest in a better way so there are cases of um German Ascari switching to the King's African Rifles, for example, if given an opportunity and under the right circumstance or wrong circumstances, I suppose. Meaning that if they judged their situation to be too grim to stay with the Germans and they had an opportunity to go over to the British lines, then in their um, in their mental world, that made sense. And this was very frustrating for German officers who, who witnessed these kinds of things or heard about soldiers who had disappeared and gone over to other uh, lines because, this, uh, because the operative notion of patriotism or you know, sort of um, serving the fatherland for them was so deeply embedded. Um, and yet uh, these African soldiers were doing something quite different. Um, it didn't make sense to them. And in fact, I, I argue that that's part of the problem of why we've we failed for so long to understand what it was that these soldiers were doing um, because we're looking through kind of a Western idealized uh, vision of why soldiers fight. Um. So my name is George. First of all, let me say thank you for what you are doing because um, it, this is something that directly speaks to what I'm trying to do for the future of Mm-hmm. And uh, I have to be honest to say that uh, I, I, I think your work right now is the only one that appears to integrate labor history and military history during the, the, the colonial period. And that's what I'm trying to do. So. <coughs> The, one, one of the things you said uh, uh, is that by by labeling the, the African campaign as sideshow, we we miss opportunities to see the commonalities and the differences uh, 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 that that occur in Africa and mm -hmm. in, in, in in Europe. Mm -hmm. So so one of the questions I want to ask is about the refugee problem, which okay. is a global problem. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the case of Cameroon, for example, the war was less intense. It was only 18 months. Mm -hmm. And it comprised, it was a, a much more smaller geographic region, and also in terms of the number of people that were mobilized, whether as porters or as soldiers and so on. Mm -hmm. But then it generated a refugee problem of between 100 to 200,000 people, which was a huge number compared to the population. So in the case of East Africa, which lasted for four years and you know, so many people involved, how intense, if any, was might have been the refugee problem that was generated as a result of, 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 of the war? Yeah. Uh, second question, if you will me, it, it has to do with sources. Okay. So, so how, how do you approach your sources? Um, uh, the, 
this question, uh, it's, it's, it, it has to do specifically with the terminology of sideshow. Mm -hmm. When I did research in Nigeria last summer mm -hmm. and Britain, I discovered that the use of the word sideshow, it, it, it was used by the, the, the senior, by the European uh, military of officers. Mm -hmm. And then later on adopted by the colonial political officers. And this is how historians have have yeah. inherited this word yeah. and, have, and, and have been using it continuously. Mm -hmm. So how do you approach their sources, those European sources that con that continually use, use, use this word? Okay, great. Um, gosh, the refugee question is a good one. It's a really good one and I haven't thought about it at all. Um, my sense from having um, from having thought about the Southern Highlands question in you know the Tanzania case, is that there's kind of a um, there's kind of a constant sense of people fleeing, but nobody captures it as such as a refugee problem, right? I mean, the way that war was waged in the colonial period, um, this is a constant. So, but, you know, I work on really the entire German period in East Africa because it's so short, but if you look over the long, over the trajectory from 1890 to 1918, what you see repeated in German officers' descriptions of how um, how Schutztruppe military operations are met by people who are, you know, experiencing them is that they run away. These people won't meet us in battle. They run away. Um, they, you know, they may leave back some young men to fight, but they hide in the long grass and then they run away. And then they attack us from behind and they run away. You know, so there's this, always this language of, um, and it's always kind of imbued with a dishonorable tinge, right? Like this is not how you fight. You should face the enemy directly. That's the German mode, or at least until Leto Forbeck comes along and um, kind of adds honor to the idea of this evading, evading style of warfare. So, um, so this problem or this um, dynamic of people fleeing, it makes perfect sense in, in light of the ways that the Schutztruppe was waging war, that they would, you know, they would come and they would surround a village and they would, um, they would somehow, if they had a, if it had a fortified wall, they would get over the top of it and then they would go through and they would seize anything that they could um, and then they would burn the village to the ground. Well, of course people fled. I mean, it's, um, but it was also uh, kind of, a, I think, a longer, there's a longer history, a longer pre-colonial history of flight as a means of um, living to fight another day, um, reconstructing somewhere else and, and living to fight another day. Um, so captured as a refugee problem, I have not seen it in that way, but I think it's a great point. Um, sources. Uh, I think, you know, the fact that somebody in 19... 16 is describing a campaign as a sideshow should not stop us from um, revisiting the topic from our vantage point and our ability to see what's happening kind of in global perspective and to ask the question, um, what, does it, what does it mean to be a sideshow if people are still dying and still suffering and still um, um, being faced with all of these really hard um, problems that have to do with survival. I mean, everyday life, right? I mean, if, you, if, if a colonial army uh, comes in and takes all your livestock because they're trying to feed themselves and leaves you with nothing, um, it has, it's not only, a, it, it not only affects your kind of socioeconomic standing and your ability to survive, it also affects the way that you view the colonial power that comes next, right? So um, I think there are lots and lots of ways in which it doesn't make sense for us to take the sources at their word when they say that something is a sideshow. It's a sideshow to the people who make policy in in London. It's, it's a sideshow to even to the generals who are fighting. I mean, Leto Forbeck himself said that um, one of his objection, uh, objectives in the war was to draw resources away from the war in Europe, right? 
if he could keep a certain number of Allied forces tied up in East, East Africa, then those people would not be available to fight elsewhere. It's a very cynical military kind of perspective. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that we have to accept that descriptor as, um, as the only way of interpreting it. And I think to people on the ground in East Africa or Cameroon or wherever, um, the, the idea of, of the war being a sideshow would not have made much sense because, uh, because of all the reasons that I listed earlier in terms of everyday survival. Good question, too. Um, I think um, the the first, well, let's, I should probably break things down a little bit more. Um, if these columns were met with an attack in this formation, um, the best that could be done would be to kind of try to um, quickly mobilize to protect whatever they could and uh, and also to hopefully get the enemy to um, to turn away. Um, but um, more often, I think what you would see would be the breaking off of this the first portion of the column, uh, the, where all the soldiers were, and the, um, the kind of the women and children and the porters being left behind um, in some kind of rear area formation um, so that they wouldn't be right at the front. Now, of course, uh, you, couldn't, you can't draw a really stark line here between those things because porters would have had to be uh, available to move back and forth to bring bullets and weapons and whatever else to, um, to wherever the soldiers were. Um, it's kind of a messy, it's a messy style. I mean, this looks very contained and kind of neat and tidy, but um, what I didn't really explain this at all, but in, in colonial warfare, this would have been referred to as a flying column. The idea was that um, you would move, you would move a contingent of troops in this kind of a formation, and they would quickly be able to peel off into fighting positions. Um, and keep in mind the the usual kind of enemy that they were confronting were um, uh, African armies that had usually not as, um, they didn't have, for example, rapid fire uh, firearms often. Um, they did not have the same kind of organizational um, training and structure to be able to mobilize very quickly into a formation, right? So, um, so this flying column kind of formation was meant to be able to break units of troops off very quickly to fight in small, uh, small confrontations, let's say. And the other people, the people who were behind them, um, would have remained in kind of a camp setting, uh, which would have been guarded by soldiers. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I painted kind of a very simple picture of what's going on here, but it's more complicated than that. Um, the goal would have been to protect, protect the families and dependents as much as possible because they were not only were they um, important to the army itself as a kind of um, um, supplemental labor force, but they were essential to the, the, the identity of the Ascari themselves as the representation of their respectability, right? Um, yes, okay. Um, so disease was a major factor, um, and I didn't say anything at all about the flu uh, epidemic that occurred between 1918 and 1919, which affected East Africa as much as anywhere else in the world. So 
thousands of people became ill um, and died because of the global influenza pandemic, which um, uh, again would be a, uh, an area that would be really useful to help bridge that temporal boundary I was describing between the end of the war in 1918 and the post-war period. Um, and then, of course, there are many other uh, endemic diseases in East Africa that affected day-to-day -day operations, so malaria, sleeping sickness, um, yellow fever, any number of mosquito-driven, uh, mosquito um, transmitted <laughs> uh, diseases. Um, problem of clean water, access to clean water, uh, which could transmit any number of intestinal problems, um, you know, um, microbes that affect, uh, affect the intestinal organs. Um, so yes, I mean, disease was a huge factor. Um, in terms of medications, here again, it would depend who you were looking at. The Germans uh, would have had to, after 1916, when the blockade really took effect on their ability to resupply, they would have had to use whatever they had on hand and, um, and to rely actually on local knowledge about how to treat things. So, um, so the use, for example, of certain kinds of tree bark to treat to, as a wound cover um, and you know, uh, trying to use the materials that they had on hand to, uh, to treat wounds and, and to heal sickness. Um, as well as relying on Africans themselves for their own ability to heal the diseases that they had experienced for generations, right? Um, the, for the British, it would have been a different story, although not necessarily that much better. I mean, they had access to supplies, but still with these columns strung out all the way um, from German East Africa to Portuguese East Africa, it makes it difficult to uh, move supplies to where the people are at any given time, right? So really it depends on what kinds of goods people could carry with them, um, whether or not those goods had been able to, that, that these columns had been able to protect them. So another aspect of this hit and style, hit and run style of warfare is that the Schutztruppe was very successful in um, kind of creeping up on the KAR columns and stealing their stuff, right? Um, or in once they crossed into Portuguese East Africa, uh, surrounding the Portuguese East African forts and stealing whatever they had there. So there's this constant kind of um, dynamic of soldiers uh, raiding each other's supplies and trying to get what's valuable. Um, and, and using it for themselves. So, um, so it was, you know, it's a mixed bag, but I would say a combo of um, whatever European supplies were still available as the war dragged on and an application of local knowledge in cases where they couldn't use um, European materials. Mm -hmm. So, is it just, um, um, is, do you assume that it's also looking at those or researching those and to, to a, a point that the way you are researching would, would give the same, same story? Mm -hmm. um, or is it assumed that the, the type of work that um, you're doing um, also thinks of those troops? Is it specific is it, to the German right, case? Right, and is it enough um, to just be studying at least one aspect to be able to make mm -hmm. a larger 
think it could make a significant difference. I mean, I, you know, I, my, I specialize in German colonialism, but I know absolutely nothing about the, the Cameroon campaign, for example. And, um, you know, just based on a sense of the different kinds of geographies and different colonialisms involved, I would expect there to be some differences in, um, in how those, uh, those campaigns played out. And I do think it would matter if you took a KAR perspective on the war as opposed to a Schutztruppe perspective, because um, the the KAR actually was um, a much more extensive army. I mean, it it, it had um, so there were soldiers in Kenya, what is today Kenya. There were soldiers in what is today Malawi, um, and far greater numbers involved, um, and and better better supply, better um, kind of communication ties, better technologies. Um, I think they were using more advanced rifles, for example, than the Germans were. Um, so so yes, I would expect. And in fact, it would you know, even bigger case then. yes. Absolutely. Yeah. It's just that I'm not an expert on the KAR yet, so I'm relying on what I know for now. But um, you know, there's there's a great. Uh, I found a great source when I was doing my dissertation research, which is now the opening to my book. So I don't know if I should tell you, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no. There's this uh, great source that I have, really kind of a, a rare find because it. It, you know, it's a complicated source because, of course, it's mediated by the German officer who's who's writing it. But he says, um, you know, he had a problem with a number of his uh, his Ascari. Um, they were in dire straits. They hadn't been resupplied. They were operating behind lines, actually in the northern part of the colony, which is uh, which was kind of a unique situation too. Um, and they were just desperate. And these soldiers began to um, express frustration with um, with the commander on the scene, and began to sort of gradually desert in ones and twos here and there. And um, and he started to get reports back about why these soldiers were um, so upset. And part of what they um, described was. Uh, Oh, so and some of them he heard had gone over to the KAR. Um, what he described was having heard from from these soldiers was um, a sense that going to the KAR would make it possible for them to have lighter duty. They wouldn't have to work as hard. They'd be better fed. They um, they'd achieve rank faster. So all of these kind of um, ideals of what it meant for them to be a soldier and to be able to uh, to achieve respectability seemed more available to them in the KAR um, than in the Schutztruppe. And um, you know, of course, I'm reading a lot into one source here, but my my sense is that the KAR was still uh, in 1916 when this source was uh, when this officer wrote the the, the report that he um, that I'm talking about. Um, there was a the KAR was projecting a strong sense of having um, a future that you know the British were going to be the next colonial overlords in this area and so it made sense for people who wanted to protect their um, their well-being and their future prospects to throw their loyalty to the British so you know all of that kind of indicates at least on the surface that the British were more together and able to project a kind of strength that the Germans had lost by 1916. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll answer your last question first. I have not done any oral histories at all. My my research so far has only been 
archival because my focus was on the German Ascari, and by the time I started my research in the uh, mid 2000s, most of them were were dead already. So I didn't pursue that angle at all, um, and I haven't done new research um, since then. Uh, although you know it would be a great project for some eager grad student to take on, I think. Um, the demobilization, I, I think this is one of the great holes, the great gaps in our understanding of what happened in the war, um, at the end of the war and transitioning into the peacetime period. I mean, I really, so just talking about the Ascari in the German um, colonial army, it's extremely difficult to trace even um, a few individual lives once the surrender happened in 1918. There are historians who have spent um, good chunks of their careers just tracing the lives of one individual Ascari who ended up in Germany. Um, and even that is, you know, there are parts of the biography that are quite murky. Um, you get sort of these glimpses of uh, veterans who have retired to certain, like, Dar es Salaam or um, uh, Arusha or, you know, so you get these pockets of um, recognition that there are veterans in this site that somebody turned up in some other research. But there's no cohesive sense of what happened to these men as an organization, right? Or, or there's no sense of them as a collective anymore after the war. So that's, um, it makes it hard then to really say much about the demobilization. All we know really is that after the surrender they were interned for a period um, while the British decided what to do with them, and then at a certain point they, they let them go. And they just decided they weren't a big enough threat for them to worry about, and they dispersed. So, um, so it's very difficult to say much um, based on what I've researched thus far about the demobilization. For the KAR, it's probably a lot easier because there are a lot more oral histories that have been done, and the British records are much more, um, are much richer. I think. So that, that is work that could be done. As to burials, um, I can't think of a single, single example to even cite right now of, um, you know, what happened, what the typical practice was. I mean, I, I don't know if it's just that I haven't been looking or if it's, if it's really not there in the sources, but there's, I don't have a strong sense of there being any kind of, um, um, specific set of practices or rituals that went into the burial of soldiers. Um, so. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I actually think there's... Maybe we should continue okay. the discussion informally since we've gone, gone over time already. But thank you very much for coming. Thank you all thank you. for your questions. And I've still got my